right now. It started. Go. Okay. That's great. Okay. Thank you, Stefan. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Hyuk Park. Uh, so we are going to start our uh, uh, buff. Uh, our buff is about the OpenMP roadmap for accelerators across DOE, pre scale, and exascale machines. And uh, we can have this buff uh, with many uh, contributors from seven national labs and six implementers. So this is all the list of uh, the, uh, the, the contributors from uh, labs, uh, the, the DOE labs and uh, the implement OpenMP compiler implementers. Uh, let me move on. So, uh, so we have, uh, the, this is a list of speakers. So I will give, us, give, uh, give you a quick introduction of this buff uh, and the uh, Kalyan Kumaran, uh, who will moderate the panel discussion session. And uh, Johannes uh, will talk about the LABM compiler and Carlo for AMD, Tobias for GNU, and Deepak for HP, and Simin for Intel, and Jeff Hammond for NVIDIA. And we also have uh, the contributors from uh, labs and implementers. So Colin Bertoni, uh, who is a co-organizer of this session, and Chris Daly uh, from the Berkeley, Ruben from Oak Ridge, and Joe from Los Alamos. Ronis and Tom, Tom from uh, Rivermore and Stefan from Sandia and Vivek from Brookhaven National Lab. And we also have the Thomas in Ye and Michael for, uh, from the Argonne National Lab and Wire from the Oak Ridge National Lab. And Kathleen is contributor for uh, GNU from Gmans. And the Syed, Ron, Greg is from, are from AMD. And Jeff Sandoval and Barbara from HPE. And we have another Jeff, Jeff Rakin and Tim Costa from uh, NVIDIA. So we appreciate all your contribution. So uh, this is the motivation of this path. So as we know, the current HPC environment is diverse and complex. So we have a variety of hardware and multiple vendors providing their own program interface and runtime. So it's critical for every application developer to consider portable solution, which can target multiple uh, platform across vendor. And uh, OpenMP is open standard and supported by almost every vendor. So we believe OpenMP could be a promising solution for this situation. Uh, the goal of this talk is uh, we would like to present the vendor's OpenMP roadmap for DOE pre exascale and exascale systems. And we want to discuss performance and evaluation, interoperability, feature support, and implementation detail and community support. And, it, in, and, and we would like to give uh, advice to application developers about what works well in their implementations, both now and in the future. So as we did last year, uh, we, uh, we created a list of uh, OpenMP uh, directives uh, frequently used by application developers. And then we surveyed, we collected uh, the, the, uh, the, these uh, features are supported by every vendor or not. So this is, uh, uh, collected table for this year. This is uh, product information as of uh, today, uh, May 11th, 2022. So uh, you can see here, uh, let me slightly move it. So we have uh, three markers. So check mark means it is supported by the, comp the compiler. And check mark with parentheses means it is supported, but uh, depending on the platform, we may have some uh, difference. So we say the yes with caveat. And then the X means no and maybe it, it, it can be implemented in the future. And we have uh, six compiler here, LLVM, AMD, HP, Intel, and NVIDIA, and GNU. Uh, we try to collect the IBM's responses. So, so last year we had the IBM column, but this year we reached out to IBM for, but for, for, for some reason we couldn't get their responses, so we could not add uh, their, their feature. But you can see uh, what kind of uh, features are supported by IBM last year. So at the end of this slide deck, uh, you can find out what we, what we had uh, last year. So you can, you can cross-check uh, this table and last, day, uh, last year table. So this is the uh, features uh, we listed. And then this is it has two pages here. So whenever you see the black color, that means uh, we collected uh, the, those, we checked the, the, uh, those features last year as well. And the uh, red color is the newly added uh, features uh, this year. So. Uh, this is responses from uh, the, each vendor. So uh, I think uh, Colin probably shared uh, the link for this slide deck. So uh, you can you can download this slide deck uh, on, on your on your laptop and check it. And if you have any question about these features, uh, uh, 
we have a panel discussion session at the second session. So uh, during the panel discussion session, you can you can ask any question to uh, the vendors representative then. Okay, and this is uh, uh, the quick list of the OpenMP resource. We have uh, OpenMP website, we have uh, a lot of information and also we have OpenMP validation and verification uh, the, the link here and YouTube channel. And also we have OpenMP user monthly teleconference. So if you wanna see what's going on in the OpenMP community, you, you may join this monthly teleconference. And the another thing is uh, we have a sister box uh, uh, at the ECP annual meeting. Uh, it was done last, uh, last week. So the name is uh, all the experience of application developer with OpenMP uploading. So at this spot, uh, we had a list of application developer, uh, which is important for DOE uh, workload. And they share their experience uh, with OpenMP compiler on the three different um, vendors, uh, GPUs. So if you are interested in uh, what happened at the bot, you may uh, find out the recording. Recording is available at the ECP annual meeting page. So please check uh, this box, uh, the recording in this box. And this is scheduled at this box today. So I'm finishing my introduction. Uh, and uh, we will have six different uh, vendors' presentation for seven minutes. So it will start with LLVM uh, by Johannes. And then uh, Carlo will talk about AMD. Tobias will talk about GNU and TPEC for HPE and Simin for Intel. And then Jeff Hammond will. Uh, give us talk for uh, NVIDIA for seven minutes. After that, we will start a panel discussion session uh, read by Kalyan uh, Kumaran. So yeah, this is uh, uh, yeah, all for introduction. So let's start uh, LLVM. So on the right-hand right, on the right, uh, right -hand side, we have uh, a timer for seven minutes. So please check your time. So Johannes, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So as you see here, it's going to be a brief uh, overview of LLVM OpenMP, especially for HPC users. And I'm not going to go into much detail, but a lot of the things that you see later on with the vendor talks, I mean, excluding GCC probably, is, is going to be similar. So they, like a lot of the vendors contribute stuff back. So what they present uh, applies to, to a large degree to LLVM as well. I'm going to like highlight the kind of community LLVM extensions and things we're doing we're kind of advancing there first in this talk instead if you have any questions please feel free to ask later so let's go on the next slide um, so if you nowadays want to build llvm clang with openmp offloading support there is a single cmake command that will get you there um, so you don't have to build clang twice and all of that stuff so it's really just uh, one CMake command, you run make and you get your um, F offload compatible Clang that supports offloading right now to AMD GPUs, um, the host and NVIDIA GPUs. There's a lot of uh, good flags to use for CMake to make your development faster, to make your builds faster and so on and so forth. Um, resources at the links below, feel free to screenshot all of the slides or just look them up online if you, if you have the link. Next one. So we're building a lot of interesting features that are like most of them are fairly new or, or unique. Um, one of the most important ones, if you have uh, OpenMP offload code that is distributed among many files is device side LTO. So you can um, link time optimize all of your device code for OpenMP offload. And we're about to also um, feature that for CUDA. So you can offload to a remote process to, to verify your memory mapping or to a remote GPU if you wanna, if you wanna um, do distributed computing. We have a virtual GPU target that allows you to debug your OpenMP offload code on the host, which is very close in the execution to a GPU actually, in, in contrast to the host offloading, which is trying to be fast. The virtual GPU is trying to be uh, amenable to debugging. Um, we allow nowadays with upstream Clang to mix CUDA and OpenMP offload code. So if you have a CUDA library device code, you can link that into your OpenMP um, binary and it will like in a, in, a, in a way, and it will link fine and you can actually call the CUDA device functions from your OpenMP offload regions. Um, we have a work in progress that is, or not upstream, but done uh, a JIT compilation for target regions such that you can specialize your offload kernels or even super optimize them and tune them. 
Um, we're currently working on OpenMP kernel extraction such that you can take a, a target region and uh, debug it in isolation and replay it and tune it, as well as portable wrappers so that you, if you want to use Thrust or Blast and so on as a force together with OpenMP, you have a way to do that. Let's go to the next slide. Now, um, earlier, like back in the day, people told you to use this one mega directive, so like OpenMP, target teams, distribute parallel four or whatever, Cindy, uh, in addition to that. You don't really have to do that anymore with, open, with LLVM since 13. If you split it up, it should just work fine. All these optimizations that uh, we need to make it fast should happen. Um, there is SPMization, it gets you CUDA like execution mode. We automatically explore shared memory for scratch, pad, for scratch pads. And we introduce guarding and synchronization where there is single threaded versus multi threaded semantics. Now, in the next slide, you see um, what you should do uh, instead of, of trying to you know, manually optimize, let's go on the next slide, is to use. Um, remarks. So we have a lot of OpenMP explicit optimizations, but also optimization remarks. So if you enable those remarks during compilation, the compiler will tell you what it could do, couldn't do, and why. And then we have these web pages that, that correspond to the remarks where you can read up on what is going on, examples, and what you can do. And um, this is really the way to interact with the compiler. And I would really recommend that you turn on the remarks all the time and kind of uh, get into that. And some of those remarks tell you to use assumptions or co code modifications to get better optimizations. Okay, next slide. Now, what we're actually working towards, which is a little bit further out, but I wanted to bring it up because it's kind of important as like a roadmap in future plans, is a system where OpenMP and the OpenMP API is really the middle end for all of those all of those diverse inputs and all of those diverse outputs. So all the CPUs, all the GPUs, the profiler hooks, the debugger hooks, remote targets, virtual GPUs, JITs, FPGAs, all of these things, you want to kind of use them no matter where you started with, CUDA, HIP, SICL, OpenMP, OpenACC, some DSL, whatever. So what we're trying to build here is in the, in the LLVM framework, because we have kind of access to everything, is really a way to unify the middle end pipeline, which will give you access to all of the fun stuff on the right, don't matter where you start on the left, and you, you can actually interoperate. So if, if some of you um, wanna, wanna implement stuff in CUDA, others wanna use OpenACC and the rest wants to use Julia, that should actually work together just fine if we agree on the middle end, the APIs, the runtimes that are in charge and so on and so forth. So this is kind of where we're going. Um, not all of it is done. As you see here, there's some color coding, but a lot of the, a lot of the arrows are either ready in, uh, under development or have a prototype implementation, which tells you that this is actually kind of doable. Uh, very few of these arrows are proposed or haven't started yet. Okay, next slide. Um, lastly, there is a lot of uh, recommendations that I could make. Uh, again, this is something to look up later because, because there is no time. We have environment variables that help you to fi figure out why your code performs the way it does, that helps you to get profiles without any fancy tools, just profiles you can download and uh, you can load into Chrome. Uh, we have assumptions that you can make, give to the compiler to improve your speed up. Um, and we have the LTO support that I mentioned earlier. So all of it, good stuff. And I think my time is up. Thank you. Uh, uh, Carlo, are you ready? Uh, hello. Um, so my name is Carlo. I'm covering, up for, I'm covering for Saeed, who could not make it today. Uh, so let's go to the next slide directly. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of features of uh, Rockham compilers for OpenMP. The first one is um, the offload arch, as we call it, offload arch library and the tool built on top of it. So what this does is fundamentally uh, it's a utility that you can use, and you know it's a library, so uh, Libo MP target actually uses it to determine what are the capabilities of the GPUs, for instance, or the devices attached to the system you're running on. So it's going to tell you things like the architecture name, 
and other properties. For instance, in this example here, you can see GFX 90A, and that's an MI200 GPU. So it gives you the architecture name and things like ECC, is it turned on or off or other feature like XNAC or, um, you know, which is fundamentally the name of the implementation of unified memory, heap unified memory on AMD GPUs. So this is something that we use in Libo MP target to determine which image to run. It works with multiple GPU systems, meaning that you could have, you could have different types of GPUs, different vendors' GPUs. And, um, you know, and it, if you go to the next slide, I'm gonna show you how it works. So let's say that you are building your OpenMP application with a command at the bottom of this slide. You are targeting two architectures with two different features. One is GFX906, um, believe it, that's MI50, and GFX908, which is an MI100. XNAC minus, meaning no support for unified memory for the first one, XNAC plus for the second one. So support for unified me shared memory, for unified memory, I'm sorry. Um, the compiler, Clang, and LLVM will generate a binary that contains two images, one for each of these two architectures. Uh, we call them uh, requirements. Uh, the requirements of an image are fundamentally a list of tags that indicate which architecture this image is supposed to run on and the characteristics. So GFX 906 and XNAC minus are the tags for the first uh, image. At runtime, when you run this application, you will uh, be able, you know, LibMP target will, let's say that you users want to offload to device number zero. So LibMP target will use offload arch tool from the previous, the library from the previous slide to determine what kind of capabilities does device zero have. And so uh, let's say that that's a GFX 906 with XNAC turned off, XNAC minus. So LibMP target will you know, look for the, all the images in its binary and select the one whose requirements match the capabilities of that device. In this case, we do have one. Uh, if there isn't any, it will give you a uh, runtime error, of course. Now, why did we do these? Um, you know, uh, you know there, there are many options here, right? But let's suppose that you are an application developer and you have clients or users that take your big application and want to run it on provision cloud nodes. You don't know in advance what kind of GPUs they're gonna run on. Uh, you don't know what kind of capabilities like XNAC plus or XNAC, XNAC minus, uh, they're gonna have these. So to avoid having to build a different binary for every possible combinations of those properties and the architectures on which they can be featured and to avoid jitting as well, then you can build a binary that has multiple images in it and it can run really anywhere. So you don't need to select based, you know, you don't really know in cloud which GPU you're gonna get or which features it's gonna get. It depends also on costs and what cloud, public cloud they are going to, there are many reasons, right? So this, is, this was kind of trying to solve that complex deployment problem. So next slide, please. Uh, let's skip this one. It's, uh, I don't have time to talk about this. I want to give you, let's go to the next one, please. Uh, I want to give you a um, suggestion when you use an OpenMP of floating unified shared memory. Uh, so in this case, we are locating in this little program, uh, two uh, memory uh, areas. To, you know, we, we have two memory, 1.2 by A and 1.2 by B. Now we are under unified shared memory mode. So to use memory pointed to by A and B inside the target region, you do not need to map those that memory. You don't need to tell the runtime, I'm gonna use this memory. The GPU runtime will issue proper loads and stores and you know, page fault handling to the right place where memory pointed to by A and B are located. Uh, that's you know the job of the XNAC facility on AMD GPUs. However, I'm you know, suggesting here that if you're running on MI200, you still use maps. So you can see there that I've out, you know, outlined, uh, underlined the two maps that are not required by the OpenMP standard and our implementation will work without them. 
But if you do use them, you are fundamentally telling the runtime, the OpenMP or floating runtime, that that memory will be used in the GPU. And so please do something about it. That something is fundamentally setting the memory to coarse grain. Um, when you allocate memory with new or malloc or now OS allocator, uh, you're going to end up with memory that is uh, the, in default grain. We call it fine grain. Uh, that's uh, you know if you if you map it, then the runtime will change the memory mode of that. Uh, it will change the memory mode to coarse grain, and that's the memory type that gives you the management type that gives you best performance on MI two hundred. So please, if you can, when it, while you are under your SM mode, please map your memory and the runtime will assist you. There is no explicit allocation on H HBM, on the device memory. There is no explicit uh, memory copy from host to device as if you were in default mode, but still, you know, uh, it, it will do, the runtime will do something to give you best performance. And I think I've just run out of time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tobias, are you ready? Yes, I am. Well, as, maybe as pre-mark, I partially comment a bit what we do at the Saucy Group at Siemens and partially what is done as GCC project in total. So it's a bit mixed. Next slide. Well, GCC, like LVM is a widely used um, open source compilers. It comes also with offloading available on uh, the Linux distributions and well, has paid unpaid contributors. So if you want to work, make us work on something in particular, you have to pay us or someone else. But of course, there's also open source support and so on. Supported is of course C, C++ and Fortran, which I think is a bit the highlight, especially since LLVM doesn't have good Fortran support yet. And we support offloading in GCC both to NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. We just had a major release uh, at the end of last week. So GCC 12, which made a big jump in OpenMP support. And well, in principle, we also have as a company, our own branch on the public GCC Git OG12 will be available shortly, which is based on GC12 and adds some features which did not make it in GC12. Next slide. Well, GC11 added a bunch of nice features, but maybe I focus on GC12 since it just released a lot, or the first OpenMP 5.1 features were added. And there was also a big jump in the Fortran support. Um, well, other highlights is that on the GCN side, debugging now works and we made a lot of progress in performance there. And also NVPTX got several updates. And well, next comes then GCC 13 or mainline, which has already, <laughs> since it was <laughs> released, um, in uh, already got some new features and more in the pipeline. So if you're adventurous, you could try that version. Otherwise, you can have a look what features are supported. There's an implementation status or, or you look at the table we had before. Next slide. While talking a bit from the user side, we have if uh, you enable OpenMP, you automatically get offloading support can also have SIMD without library depends if you just want to use that feature and then you have, can choose well, what offloading targets you want to disable if you don't want to stick with the default. And it's possible to build uh, NVPTX and GCN support in the same binary. Otherwise you might, may need some optimization options and well, we also have a couple of flags to help diagnosing a bit what is happening by the compiler and also have 
support for vendor math factorization libraries in terms of the compiler. Next slide. Well, for NVPTX, we generate currently generic code, which is then jitted at the startup. So it's a bit less dependent on the SM flags as jitting helps quite a lot and also helps with uh, optimizing things which are in some libraries that have been jitted. But we do have some SM support. The GC12 support increased to support more. <laughs> and well, it's expected that quite some performance improvements will come soon uh, on the MVGCN side. We also support a couple of systems. MI100 is currently the latest. I assume more will come in both areas, but not yet for GC12, obvious since it was released. And of course, there's debugging support. There's a very nice video showing it. Um, next slide. And well, well, first, I'd like to acknowledge Oak Ridge since they funded it. And well, I'm seemingly a bit too fast in talking about the new features, but at least I'm excited for GCC 12, which added, as I said, a lot of new features. And I hope that we can consolidate a bit more on with GCC 13, filling missing gaps, and then also concentrate a bit, which already started on documentation and diagnostic and so on. Well, I think that's it. Okay. And more than that, the panel, if you have questions. <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, if you have any questions, you can leave it in the chat so we can uh, use that during the panel discussion. So thank you, Tobias. Uh, Deepak, are you ready uh, to start? Yeah, audio is okay? Yeah, looks good. Okay, Thanks. yep, next slide. Yeah, so CCE is our compiler. We support, um, you know, of course, there's a C and C++ and Fortran compiler available. In terms of the base language support, our Fortran compiler, we tend to try to keep pretty up to date with the latest Fortran standards. So we support Fortran 2018 there. And for our C and C++ compilers uh, right now, we're supporting, um, you know, it's based on Clang. So we, ha we have the same uh, base language support that's available through Clang. Um, there, in terms of offloading support, we do support NVIDIA and AMD GPUs, uh, where right now we are fully 4.5 compliant. We're, I would say we're near um, complete status for 5.0. And we're um, working through completing 5.0 and also um, some of the later features in 5.1 and 5.2. Um, there are some differences um, between Fortran and C, C++ support in some, in some areas. And um, that will be um, noted in the upcoming slide. Um, again, this, this is largely due to the fact that um, th there, the compiler infrastructure itself is, is different for a Fortran compiler and C and C++ compiler. Some years ago, we moved towards using Clang for C and C++. So there are some differences in um, the, the, feature cap the features that are supported across those languages. Um, just the other note here is that there are some other offloading models available through CCE. So we do have uh, OpenACC support for Fortran and um, HIP supports available for um, C++ targeting AMD GPUs. But of course, our OpenMP solution, the benefit there is that um, it works across all the base languages and it, it's able to support multiple, um, multiple device types. Next slide, please. Okay, so our CCE OpenMP support is based on a, it's, it uses a proprietary OpenMP runtime library. Um, and this, this is also the case for our Clang, um, our C, Clang base C and C++. So we all, we're, regardless of the base language that's used, we're always gonna be using our, our own runtime library. Um, we do have uh, the ability to take the code that's generated from uh, Clang and, and have that implemented on top of our runtime. We have basically a wrapper uh, interface that will target our, our own runtime library. Um, so this allows us to support um, cross-vendor OpenMP interoperability. So you could have codes that are compiled um, you know, with uh, the CCE compiler, and then some source files might be compiled with another Clang-based compiler. 
and uh, they can all uh, be linked together and then use our runtime library and it, sh it should work fine. We'd also have some, um, some support also for the GNU uh, libgomp interface, but that's, that's a bit behind right now. That's up to openmp3.1. Um, we have, uh, in terms of our implementation, um, we have a sort of an optimized cogen for offload regions. Uh, and we've also done work in our Clang-based uh, C and C++ compiler um, to, uh, to to tune the way we we generate code for for GPUs there. So we we have an alternate path for code generation in our compiler versus what uh, you might see with the upstream compiler. Um, as I had mentioned, we have uh, uh, 5.0 is in progress. Uh, we've made pretty good progress on that. It was a, it was a, it was a very large specification, a lot of a lot of features there. Um, but we've made pretty good progress there, and there's some a few remaining features there that we're working working on completing uh, this year. And then also um, at the same time, we're working through some 5.1 and 5.2 features, and um, are trying to get that done um, sometime during the course of uh, next year. Uh, one, you can consult the release notes uh, and the intro OpenMP man page for a full detailed list of the features that we're supporting and what aren't supported. And there's also some um, information there about implementation specific behavior uh, for certain um, parts of the spec. Uh, okay, next slide. Okay, so this chart sh just shows sort of the evolution of our support and of, our, of the OpenMP 5.0 specification across various releases. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, I mean, 5.0 was obviously a very large um, specification uh, in terms of the number of features that were added. So we started supporting that um, number of releases ago and over many releases. Um, and so in CC14, uh, which is releasing this month, uh, we added some support for additional, uh, some, some additional features. Um, and we did a lot of work actually more recently on just um, improving the existing capabilities, existing support, including some bug fixing. So um, some of the features um, development has slowed down a little bit as we've prioritize you know, um, quality improvement of existing features. Um, but we are looking towards um, completing the 5.0 um, implementation over the course of this year. And some of the remaining features um, that I've mentioned there is shown um, better support for loop, loop construct for C and C++, mappers and Fortran. Um, there's various features for Fortran that we are, we're looking to uh, complete this year. Um, uses allocators uh, is a feature that we're looking to support. Um, better support for concurrent mapping, um, cancellation for task loops, scan, and also reductions for target tasks. Next slide. Okay, so this slide just kind of gives an overview of how we go about uh, in CCE mapping uh, various device constructs to the GPU and try to exploit the GPU parallelism. Um, so, uh, you know, as is no well known for the GPUs, you typically have three levels of parallelism. And a frequent question for users is, you know, how do we, how do they exploit this parallelism with OpenMP constructs? And so this table just shows the basic mapping, and this this is very similar to what other compilers do. But I just wanted to make note here of some differences that you would see with CC versus other compilers. So with CC, for example, um, uh, with our Fortran compiler, uh, we will not uh, use parallel really to control parallelism. Um, the, the preferred way to controlling parallelism is through the SIMD construct within a thread block. Teams construct is for cross thread blocks. For a Clang based compiler, um, both parallel or SIMD can be used to control parallelism within thread block, but there are some limitations in terms of what can be handled within a parallel construct or a parallel region um, uh, where we will, for certain constructs or routines that might be used, we would end up uh, executing those parallel constructs with a single thread. So users should make note of that. And we are looking to uh, improve the ability to control this parallelism with these constructs. So I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is so I, I think I've reached the, the limit of my talk here, but just really quickly, uh, you know, we've made some improvements with our detached support for detachable tasks. We made some improvements um, for uh, task dependencies or uh, using depend clause with asynchronous device constructs and mapping them more efficiently to streams. Um, we've improved the, uh, the, the, the cross device dependencies. Um, well, that's, that's an area we're looking to support. But one of the areas we have support um, improved more recently is multi-threaded use of GPUs. 
Um, we were kind of using a very conservative locking strategy before, and we improved that in CC13, so that should work better. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Simin, are you ready? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So I'm going to give a quick a brief update of the Intel compilers for OpenP support. Next slide. Next one. All right. So I basically going to cover the high level overview of the OpenP standard support in the Intel's compiler, plus a few new features we have added into the Intel compiler for OpenP, like a USM allocator support. And also, given the new emerging SQL DPC++ program language, we put a pretty a big effort to make sure the OpenP have a good interability with the SQL and the DPC++. And uh, we recently we added the earth synchronized offloading and the OpenP SMD support. Plus, uh, I have a high level update on the Intel's the IFX uh, uh, compiler status. Uh, and to make sure we are, uh, while we are support the OpenP also, going to cover latest the Fortran 2018-2080 standards as well. Okay, next slide. All right, so uh, as probably many of you guys already know, Intel has two sets of the uh, compilers. One is what we call the classical compiler, which is based on Intel's, uh, you know, the ICCI for the technology. Then the new compiler called ICX and the IFX is based on the LBM infrastructure. And also, especially for the ICX, the C++ compiler is based on the client front end. So the, all the new 5.05152 features, we are, added, uh, we are adding those features to be part of the ICX, IFX compiler. So for example, OpenP offloading, it's going to be everything is based on LVM infrastructure, not based on Intel's uh, classical uh, IR or the ICCI effort compiler. So with that, the, the table shows a high level summary what kind of the uh, uh, high level features uh, like OpenP offload is going to be supported in the uh, YAPI DPC++, uh, DPC++, C++ compiler and the IFX compiler. And the OpenP 4.5, everything for CPU, we're going to continue support that for the, you know, the uh, in the classical compiler and the new uh, IFX and ICX compiler, okay. And also there, uh, as we know, uh, Intel uh, H and the toolkit, we have the HPC toolkit and the base toolkit, and the Fortran compiler is going to be part of the HPC toolkit, will not be part of the base toolkit. Okay, hopefully this table give you a really high level summary to say what is the uh, high level sort of, uh, status of the Intel compiler for OpenP standards. Next slide. All right, as I mentioned, we added the uh, support for, uh, you know, USM, Unified Shared Memory for the OpenP memory allocator. In this simple example shows you, you can allocate, for Fortran allocator statement, you can put the OpenP target shared memory allocator and the pragma around that. So basically the compiler will generate the code to fully leverage Unified Shared Memory. So then you don't have to uh, do the data mapping for those kind of USM memory, okay. So this is a simple Fortran example shows you how the OpenP memory allocator is supported for the USM. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, we have put a huge effort to improve the OpenP and the SQL composability. So next slide shows you, uh, let's go with the next slide. The, the next slide shows a very simple example. For example, you have OpenP parallel sections, then you have two sections. So one section you can call run OpenP, and in that uh, run OpenP, basically you can use OpenP target, uh, you know, for the offloading. And there's another parallel OpenP section, so you can run DPCPP in that function, you can write the SQL or DPC++ code to do the offloading. So essentially, this is the one so a simple example to illustrate how we can compose OpenP and the DPC++ together with diff, depends on the you know, uh, 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 leaf function, what you can do in the leaf function based on the SQL or based on the OpenP offloading. Okay, next slide. Then one of the, another big feature based on the 
the hyperthread technology uh, inside the clan and the LVM infrastructure, we enabled our code generation backend uh, back compiler code generation to support asynchronous offloading, essentially to support no weight for offloading. So in this simple example, you can see uh, once you have the no weight clause on, the, uh, the, once you after uh, your uh, launch to the kernel, the, the uh, host thread will continue to execute to print before the explicit offload, right? You print the old value. Then the uh, device uh, on the device run uh, in the kernel, you print the whatever new value generated inside the kernel function. Then after that, you can see the on the host side, the data, the, the variable read has, uh, has the new value coming back from the host. This is essentially tells your host uh, you know, the threads and the uh, launch, the, the GPU or device can be running concurrently uh, with this asynchronized offloading support. Okay, next slide. Okay, then one of the, uh, as a, you know, for both in, uh, uh, Intel's CPU and the GPU, we have the SMD engine built inside the, uh, the our hardware. So one of the uh, huge efforts to try to enable the vectorization for both GPU and the CPU. So giving this simple example, you can see you can do the auto parallelization and the inner SMD. So basically in this simple example, we launch the kernel to running the outer loop concurrent uh, in parallel on the device. And the inner loop will generate a vectorized code to run fully utilize our, uh, our SMD engine inside the, the hardware. So that gives you the hierarchical parallelism support of the parallel and SMD parallelism. Okay, next slide. And also the, we are adding the whole bunch of the uh, support in our new IFS compiler to try to be comp uh, compliant to the Fortran 2008, 2018. There's a lot of the new features uh, to try to align with the new standard. And also we added the auto offload support for Fortran to concurrent loop. You know, the do concurrent loop, basically the compiler automatically convert the do concurrent loop to the uh, OpenP target, uh, and this is the parallel for loop based on the certain uh, heuristics and the cost model. So this is a, a list of the uh, summary of the new uh, latest Fortran compiler status. Okay, I think that's what I have for today. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Simin. Uh, Jeff, are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next. Yeah, so just as a high level overview, um, we support a bunch of different programming models in our software environment. Uh, C++, Fortran, and Python parallelism through either the ISO spec or whatever NumPy is, if it's a spec. Uh, obviously, we support OpenACC. We support a subset of OpenMP5 that I'll get to. Uh, and then we support CUDA and everything. Uh, and these things are interoperable within within reason. Um, they're certainly interoperable with managed memory across all the models. If you use managed memory, they can all work with it, and and it, you just don't worry about memory allocation anymore. Um, you can certainly call CUDA from OpenMP um, within reason, obviously, as long as you're not doing evil things with the execution models that are incompatible. Um, etc. So, um, and in response to the query from DOE, I did find one or two compiler bugs about CUDA Atomics and OpenMP, which are is completely unnecessary, but nonetheless, I found them. So, um, and you can compose OpenMP and OpenACC if, if that's what you need to do. Um, there are some weird things there that happen when you have a very large code and you start using shared libraries that I can't tell you what the answer is. I can just say that you know, shared libraries plus big codes equals fun, um, but but you can work them out. It just it just might not work the first time. Um, next slide, please. So just as a very basic overview, um, you know, our flags flags look like this. So you you say MP and MP equals GPU or MP and dash target equals GPU. Uh, you can specify your you know compute capability, et cetera. And if you type, you know, compiler dash help, you can get more info. If you do M, M info equals MP, you'll get diagnostics about OpenMP. Um, and then, you know, there's some some things where there's some reuse of OpenMP or sorry, OpenACC environment variables. 
Um, but in general, there are, our compilers are pretty simple in this respect. You don't have to, there's not a lot of flags. Most, most of the action is, um, is straightforward. Next slide. Um, yeah, so I think everybody knows what these things do. do. Um, you know, we we don't support or or we ignore SIMD on the GPU. Our GPUs don't use SIMD hardware. Uh, they're just threads. So we use Teams in parallel, and that's it. If you use SIMD on the CPU code, it'll it'll hint for vectorization. Next slide. Um, you know, we don't support some things because um, either they're too new and we haven't committed to doing them and may not do them, or because they're just dumb ideas, um, you know, calling critical sections on a GPU is just a dumb idea. Um, and uh, you should use atomics or some other lock free approach. Um, so we, we don't support, uh, you know, every possible thing that you could do, we try to support the things that real codes use and that um, programmers are going to be successful with. Next slide. Um, one of the things that uh, we're encouraging people to try is OpenMP loop. Um, this is sort of inspired by OpenACC loop. It's descriptive parallelism. It's easier to use. And I'm going to show you a case study in just a second um, how we use this stuff. So next slide. So matrix transpose is my favorite example for, for breaking things. This is all Fortran, but the same things are generally true in C. So you can write OMP target teams to do parallel four or parallel do SIMD collapse two. Um, and you have to be wise about the loop orderings. You know, and obviously in transpose, you, you've got to pick whether, you know, reads or writes are, or, or the ones you want to make contiguous. Um, so obviously there's, you know, this is not a GPU or an OpenMP specific problem. This is just how you write Fortran intelligently. But there's a 3x difference in how you order the loops. Uh, the compiler doesn't magically permute those in this case. Um, and but we'll see in just a second. So 51% of peak in transpose is either good or bad, depending on your perspective. 12% is definitely bad. Next slide. So if you use loop, um, the compiler does a better job. I can't tell you why. I'm not a compiler person. Um, but you know, loop loop gives the compiler in our case more freedom to do the right thing. So it bumps up the performance by six percent in the good case. Um, so at the very least, for something like this, where typing more characters takes more work, less characters, less typing, and the performance is better. Next slide. Um, so this is now with tiling. So we do not support the tile clause I, uh, that you know is I think is available maybe in LLVM now. Um, but you can, of course, write tile code yourself. Um, and if you do that with loop, um, you get a really nice result. 72% of peak is you know about as far as you can get without switching to something. Um, more custom like CUDA. Uh, and this will be roughly equivalent to what OpenACC with the loop directive will do, because obviously we have we have the loop directive there, so you don't need to write the loop by hand. Um, but this is just to show, you know, if you use the, the team's loop and the loop clause with collapse um, and you can write tiling, I, I think that this ends up with better results and, and is more straightforward mentally um, than the team's distributed parallel four stuff. So next slide. This is another one I did. Um, I don't know if this is interesting to people, um, but I wanted to show sort of some of the examples that, that come up in, in how people think about memory allocation, memory management. So this is the preamble to a, a DAXB code. So this is, I'm not measuring the DAXB performance because the DAXB performance is, you know, what it is, you know, you get the data in the right place and it goes fast. Um, this is to show what the overheads are, are of different things. So if you turn on managed memory, allocation costs more. That's because obviously you're going through a different allocator to do managed memory allocation, which is more expensive. On the other hand, if you have managed memory on, the map, the data map clauses become no ops. Um, the compiler basically just looks at them and doesn't do anything because it knows the hardware will take care of it. So those things get cheaper. And then of course, if you've zeroed things on the host and then you uh, go to you know initialize it on, on the device, um, Sorry, I missed I missed the target offload of the the initialization there. Um, then then you have to pay the price to to fault uh, fault those pages in the right place. Obviously, if you don't initialize on the host, uh, you won't be paying for that. But I just I throw this out there because you know some sometimes these things end up in you know you might want to move your cost towards allocation or away from allocation or towards initialization or away from it, um, and just to know that there are things you can do. To, to change this behavior. And you could stop here. I don't remember what's next.
Okay, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, all speakers. So now we are moving on the panel discussion. So Kumar, uh, you can take over. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any general questions for the uh, speakers um, before we get started? I have a set of questions that have been given to me, and I think uh, all the uh, uh, presenters have seen the questions. They have contributed it to it too. Um, but if there are any general questions uh, anybody wants to ask based on their presentations, it's a good time to speak up. There was a question in the chat um, from Ruben about, I think like we can ask generally for all the implementations, like if you're using unified shared memory, when does page migration happen, whether with mapping or without mapping? And yeah, I think uh, Carlo responded, but it might be interesting to see if other vendors want to comment on that let me let me clarify something uh, it doesn't matter if you mapped it or not the, this behavior migration is independent of uh, what we do from a let's call it a memory advice perspective so fine grain or coarse grain memory doesn't really matter at this point so it depends on the xnec mode you're running on so xnec enabled is what you're looking for uh, we support unified unified memory that's the configuration I want to be in. And second is, how did you allocate that memory? That's, that's what determines uh, the migration policy. Yeah, Anybody for CCE, else? yeah, for CCE, um, we support unified shared memory for the same AMD GPU platform. And so our, our behavior would be the same as what Carla described. Jinmin, Jeff. Uh, for for the Intel's GPU, the page migration is uh, controlled by the GPU driver. Basically, we provide the pinned host memory and also the what we call a shared memory, which is uh, uh, involved the page migration based on the your uh, your ownership of your data access. Then there, the device memory is always uh, stays on the device. It's not accessible by the host thread. So the host pinned memory and uh, uh, USM uh, shared memory is can be accessible by both the host device and uh, the host and the device. That's our model. So page migration is uh, controlled by the the GPU driver automatically maintain the cache, the coherence. Okay. Yeah, for NVIDIA, it's on PCI bus. It'll be page migration. If you have NV link to the host, it may not do that at all, but that's hardware specific. That's right. I think most of Windows does, uh, if we use a PCIe, essentially pretty much a, a same behavior. Yeah. Yeah, LLVM, the client compatible, just piggyback on what the, what the specific vendor GPU and driver does. Uh, though requires unified chip memory is implemented, but not as tested as I would like it to be. Yeah, and on the GC side, I just checked the effort in the OG11 branch uh, for the NVIDIA GPU, and there uh, it, well, it uses alloc managed and the, the call to the CUDA library, and uh, it doesn't do any mapping, but yeah. OK. I think I think let's go to the panel questions. I have about ten or eleven of them. Um, need not be restricted to those. Uh, you know, people listening to this uh, can post uh, follow up on the chat, um, and we Colleen or Jay will help me uh, if I don't keep track of them. And uh, so again, I won't call out a particular vendor to start with. You guys take turns. And if somebody has already mentioned something, um, don't try and repeat it that, that you support it or something like that. Let's keep this moving on. So the first question um, is maybe more for the, uh, for the semiconductor vendors. Um, what do you see as advantages of uh, OpenMP? Uh, why should people use OpenMP? And more importantly, how does your implementation compares to some native programming model that you support, be it Sickle, be it uh, uh, CUDA, or be it HIP? And uh, a follow-up question would be also as to um, how does your OpenMP implementation perform compared to the 
uh, native programming model. So take turns, uh, whoever wants to go first, and it's not res restricted to the semiconductor vendors, others can speak up too. So. I can get yep. started if you want. Okay, yeah, good. So, uh, why, uh, what do you see the advantages of OpenMP? It's practically the thing that will run everywhere, right? If you write things in a native language, then you're not gonna be able to port it easily to other architectures. That's, you know, that's the uh, financial statement for users. If you don't wanna rewrite your, um, your application 10 times, please use OpenMP. Second is, um, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not trying to interrupt you, though I am, but I want to say one thing is portability is uh, one of the pros of uh, OpenMP, but I did hear uh, from application folks who have, you know, who always look for guidance on what programming model to use on a specific architecture or a specific system. Uh, come back and say that the OpenMP implementation or the compiler lags behind the native programming model. So in, that is another thing that would be good. Yeah, in performance. So yes. yeah, there is an advantage of portability, but we don't get the performance we want. And so how do you kind of push the vendors to make sure that OpenMP is so compatible? There are, two the aspects. there are two aspects here that are important, right? First of all, uh, if had we dedicated the same amount of time and efforts to open MP implementation as we did to everything else, then that equation would be different. The second thing is, it depends also on what you measure, right? If you get two developers to start writing native code in or open MP code, I'm pretty sure that if you look at them after a week or two weeks, you're gonna have a way different performance thing. So we are measuring open MP against the native implementation that have been optimized to death for over you know, many years. So, I mean, what is the comparison we're doing here? I think, yes, there are uh, specific performance differences between OpenMP and native programming languages. That's undeniable, but OpenMP is gonna get there. That's a message I'm getting you. And today, if you had to start writing new code, I think it would be uh, much better served by starting writing OpenMP. So this is AMD stance, so to speak, that you try and make sure that your compilers, be it OpenMP or HIP, uh, match in performance. And your advice to any new application developer moving to your platform is stick to your OpenMP code and try and get the best performance on our platform, hardware platform. Yep. So um, from an NVIDIA perspective, um, yeah, the, I would say today there's some small implementation gaps between OpenMP and OpenACC. Um, but the bigger issue for performance on the NVIDIA platform is OpenMP has no path to exposing some of the cool hardware features that we're building. Um, and if you look at GTC 22 talks on Hopper, you can find out more. Um, things like tensor cores have no standard exposition in any programming model. You want tensor cores, you write CUDA or you write Cutlass, um, or you call a library. If you want to use async, mem copy, DMA, all sorts of fun stuff like that to, to hide bandwidth and, and minimize cache pollution, um, you can't do that with OpenMP. No compiler in the world can reason about those sorts of things, um, and the OpenMP language has no support. So if you want to get the speed of light performance, um, on our hardware, if it's going to depend on any of those features, you're going to have to write CUDA or something that behaves like CUDA, which basically means CUDA, sometimes open ACC. Um, the performance portability story is, in my view, is basically that if, if you look like um, a DAXP, right, if you're streaming memory bandwidth, all programming models converge to 80% or better. If it looks like matrix transpose and you have coalesced memory access problems, you get 50% or better, depending on how hard you work. And if it looks like, you know, complicated stuff like n body or linear algebra uh, matrix multiplication, you're going to miss the, you know, speed of light by a factor of 10 or more um, if you don't write native. So um, the fact is there's no free lunches unless you're just going to call Blas libraries. Okay. Uh, Zinman, you want to say something? Sure. Yeah. Uh, from the uh, uh, from the Intel's perspective, basically we are always looking at the three things like uh, portability, performance, and uh, the productivity, right? 
So I have an example while the customer code is around the two million lines of the code. They try to use a native language to run it on the device. That took them roughly rewrite a whole bunch of things, take two years. When the switch decided to use OpenP, starting from the, the sequential code, took them like a, a six months to get a similar sort of a performance. So I think the message probably more or less is mixed. So it really depends on and your application and also depends on what kind of hardware feature you want to expose. For example, in the Intel compiler, in order to get a performance, especially close to the metal performance, right? We try to provide the intrinsic support. You can use the intrinsic or inline assembly inside the offload region to get access to the, your hardware features. So it really depends on the level of the, the effort and also the performance target you have. So, and the average the performance, the uh, open P may not give you a, a close to a peak performance. Maybe you can get 50% or 60%, but with the extra mi a few miles with a little bit more ninja tuning, you could get some, something like a 70% or close to 80%. That's the experience we had on the Intel's so on CPU before. A lot of open P code eventually we were able to get around the 75% of the peak, hardware peak, which is pretty decent. So it's always kind of a mix that depends on the, uh, in my opinion, it depends on how much effort you put into the open P and what kind of extra features you can put beyond the open P to access your, uh, you know, the hardware features. It's uh, try to get your like three P like a portability performance and the productivity. That's our opinion. Okay. Okay. So what I'm hearing is that all three of you semiconductor vendors developing your own compilers make sure that OpenMP is the primary, uh, or at least one of your key programming models that you support right. and you encourage yeah. people to do that. Yeah. Um, there could be missing features that are not supported today on OpenMP and hopefully it will evolve, which might need you to fine tune, maybe use assembler, maybe use uh, another programming model. Uh, and you do support interoperability, blah, blah, blah to your uh, current uh, OpenMP programming model that you can do that. Uh, but otherwise uh, you have no issues in, uh, in people choosing OpenMP as their uh, programming model for, uh, for putting their application. That's correct. And also I want to put one point, uh, point out the latest OpenMP standard 5.2 introduced a new, what we call the OpenMP extension mechanism to allow user or vendors adding their own extension. You can put that as some, for example, if you have an API, you can put OpenPX, or you can, in the pragma, you can say OpenPX. So you can add your own extension as a part of the beyond the current OpenP standard can do. So we build up those kind of extension mechanisms for the vendors, yeah. Okay, anybody else wants to quickly chime in? Jeff, you had something, you raised your hand or you just moved it? No, I, I, I don't know that we encourage OpenMP. Uh, OpenMP is something that certain customers have insisted upon. Um, it's certainly better than than doing nothing. Um, but and it's certainly great if you have an on doll situation where you want to get more and more code running on the GPU. Um, but you know, we just generally don't think it takes advantage of uh, the best best features in our hardware. Uh, nor does it give to compilers the same opportunity to do interesting things. Yeah, that makes the interability support or composability support more important, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's that's part of it too, is is we, we, we our customers are already using a bunch of other things. And so OpenMP got added to the pie um, rather than, you know, starting from, from more of a clean slate. Right. But I mean, the, the question is, is there an inherent reason why it would be slower? And, and there's, there's three reasons why it could be slower. One is the additional runtime overhead because your OpenMP gives you this tracking of memory, the mappings, the reference counting and all of that. But OpenACC has that too. And people have sworn that OpenACC is performing and so on and so forth. And from all our measurements I could take, that is not going to be a bottleneck if implemented reasonably. So that one is out. And then code generation. OpenAC, OpenMP has the problem. It started as a sequential programming model where parallelism was added. So it gives you this capability to do work sharing automatically or other things like starting threads and so on and so forth, 
which is which you have to deal with explicitly in the in the GPU languages, any kernel language you have, that costs overhead because it gives you magic. It, it deals with all the corner cases. It deals with the fact you have only one thread or you have a million threads and your loops has one iteration or a million iterations or two million and so on. So it deals with all of that. But with, with user information and compiler optimizations, that goes away. And if that abstraction goes away, you get exactly the same assembly code as you would get with a kernel language. And the third is, oh, we have the these hardware features that we don't expose. That is correct. But if you look at CUDA, for example, um, the hardware features are exposed mostly through built-in runtime functions. What is the difference if I call atomic add or a library that exposes a function that is called atomic add that then translates to whatever the hardware has? The, the, the problem with OpenMP is it has to kind of provide this portably while the CUDA language just has to provide one function and then just maps. So as long as we can provide this wrapper library that maps it to the right thing, it looks exactly the same. It doesn't- I, I think, I think the, the, the missing piece is that there are more, there are so, open MPs like C++, there are so many different ways to do the same thing. Now, if you said only write open MP on GPUs using the NVIDIA style guide, okay? you might end up in a certain place. We might be happier. But the problem is Intel and AMD won't say the same thing. And we had for years that whole situation where Cray was ignoring parallel and putting all the GPU threads in SIMD. And it took Nurse banging on that issue for years for that to come back and have the compilers actually interpret the notion of parallel threads on a GPU the same way. And so the problem is like in OpenACC, because there's less control, it is harder to create divergent code, you know, the absence of certain compilers is another issue. But in OpenMP, like Zingman, Shinman's example with the Saxby, right? He's got that inner loop with the SIMD lane. If you do that on our compiler, all you're generating is unnecessary instructions that do, do nothing because our compiler doesn't need SIMD and doesn't do anything with it. So you're just, unless the compiler can hoist all of that, delete all that code, you're going to end up with a bad implementation. So we end up with performance portability issues because nobody has agreed on the one true GPU hardware execution model, which is fine. And none of the compiler people seem to agree on exactly the right mapping of the OpenMP execution model down to even the, some abstract universal GPU. And so as long as real people write real code, W without total knowledge of everything, we're going to end up with all sorts of, uh, you know, potholes or whatever in the performance landscape. I mean, arguably, you you actually said we're we're merging to or we're going towards conformance across all the vendors and compilers, in parts because we all start to agree on things. We most of us build on on Clang and so on and so forth. And to play devil's advocate, if I only have one compiler for a language. Obviously, I agree on everything and I can tell people what to do and all is fine and dandy. But even there's two compilers that compile CUDA code and they don't agree on it. So really, this is this is not an argument. This is just the fact that we can't we can't agree on as a community. It has nothing to do with what language we're writing here. <laughs> okay. Um I think I think we should move on. Uh, there were some follow-up questions, one more pertaining to CUDA. The Jeff, you can uh, answer in the chat session. Um, and then Tom points out that this is no different from open ACC from the point you are making. Um, so, so my next question, um, again, uh, uh, the, it's about how you prioritize the features uh, for the specification um, that you want to implement. Um, so um, JWOOC showed a, a table in a slide uh, in the beginning as to the different uh, OpenMP directives in 5.0 and 5.1 and maybe 5.22 or um, that, that you plan to support or not plan to support uh, for each vendor. So any quick remarks on you know, how you came up with the list? Uh, um, is it throwing darts or looking closely at applications and what your users use? So maybe we start with Deepak uh, since we had the semiconductor guys talk too much last time. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, the way we prioritize uh, for 5.0 was really driven by um, user requirements. So we we had a um, uh, basically a spreadsheet of all the various OpenMP 5.0 features, and we sent that out to to users that we we're interacting with, and just solicit feedback from them on what what are the features that they view as high priority. And uh, we ordered that. We also took a look at the, um, the our estimates of how long it would take to, to develop those implementations for those features and we kind of took those two factors together um, to decide how we wanted to, to to plan out what we were going to be supporting in each given um, version of the of CCE and that's how we kind of spaced out over multiple releases which which subset of features we we're going to be supporting but it was driven by both feedback from users on what they deemed as you know high, high priority uh, what we were seeing was actually being used in applications particularly um, applications that are, you know, very important for, say, acceptance, for example, that might be using particular features, we would obviously um, put high priority on those features. And also taking into account also implementation effort, what, where, where we feel we need to devote time early on. If there's some particular features that are both high priority and are very easy to implement um, based on the existing infrastructure we already have in place, that's something that we might um, get to get to earlier, for example. So, so let me ask you a follow-up question. So looking at that list, I don't remember it. Uh, yeah. Maybe you do. Um, did you, as a system vendor, supporting you know, various forms, various GPUs, um, do you feel in your, uh, uh, in your compiler, there are features that you don't support, but maybe the, uh, the GPU vendor compiler supports? Uh, um, and were you you were left wondering as to why, or uh, you know, how come your users didn't give you that input or something like that? Uh, well, I mean, there's certain. Uh, so one thing I, I guess I would mention is one of the limitations right now in CCE is we're not supporting calls to um, like CUDA kernels, for example, uh, from OpenMP target regions, and that's something that was mentioned that's being supported, for instance, in the NVIDIA compiler. Um, we have not received, I don't think, the feedback from our users yet that this is a very critical thing to support, but certainly that's something we've, we've talked about adding support for, particularly if we got that sort of feedback that that was important. So today with CCE, um, being able to call uh, device functions uh, from OpenMP target regions, that would be an example of something where not available today, but if we get feedback that this is highly important from users, that's, that's something that we would look into supporting. There will be some inherent limitations there, I think, and how we would handle it, given, as was mentioned earlier, about differences in the execution model. But um, that's something we could potentially try to support. Sorry, Johannes, go ahead. Yeah, you might get that for free from Clang, so, okay. <laughs> which, is, which, is, which is one of those benefits. If we agree on you know, things, we can actually get uh, the behavior in everywhere and feature, feature parity across the board. And that's not restricted to CUDA, right? It could be any native program uh, model. No, we, we just did CUDA for starters, but uh, this we're, we're currently talking with the folks that do a Clang hip um, to get the same um, offload embedding. It's it's mostly about infrastructure. It's not the tech, like it's it's making things compatible. And the Clang hip is, is an XNOL list and SQL after. So no, it's absolutely not restricted to CUDA. Okay. Anybody else uh, wants to chime in on their list? And so yeah, I can I can tell you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I went ahead. first. Let, let me go last this time. Yeah. But, okay. So uh, for Intel, the the way driving us to define the future as a priority is basically, uh, Kumara, you you probably are gonna all the applications coming from the Aurora project, right? It's our priority whatever features needed for those applications, it, it gets a priority. And beyond that, of course, our other HPC application, AI application, and uh, customers, if any features they need, that gets a priority. The secondary is everything, all the features coming from the, for example, spec ICC OpenP, spec HPC for those industry standard benchmark rates, uh, whatever feature needed for those also get, get a secondary priority. The third one is all those stuff from the, for example, for the standard conformance test rate like solve F, solve C from the Argon under the University of the you know, Delaware and uh, 
the, the features that are coming from those standard conformed suite also get us a, a, a sort of the priority. That is pretty much a three sources we define the priority to implement the open key features. Okay, go ahead, back to you, Carlo. Unless it is somebody else who needs to talk before me. No? <laughs> no, <go laughs> okay, ahead. So what yeah. do we do? I, I think the implementation is mature enough now that we need to look from a functionality perspective of what are the priorities of our customers. And that may be the Department of Energy and other you know, customers that use OpenMP. Now, uh, that's for functionality. So we really have a list and we go through the list in, in the order that we it is given to us by, by users, right? Second thing is performance, you know, and, you know, Ila is here, you can attest that we care about what users uh, are doing in their programs, actually, not uh, in an abstract way, what we think they should be doing. And we, you know, we follow their instructions, like the direction, and we implement what they believe we should be implementing first. So, you know, we are at the point in which there are many things that need to be implemented for OpenMP, for instance, 5.2. Uh, and you know they, they will give us input on what is the right direction to go first. So let me ask you, Carlo, um, if you're familiar with OLCF and the applications that came out of Summit, um, do you find uh, any discord between the OpenMP directives that you guys support for AMD GPU and AMD compilers as opposed to what NVIDIA deemed as important uh, previously for Summit? So when the applications run, is there a directive that's not supported or not running well because the runtime doesn't map correctly on your GPUs? Um, is there anything that you can comment on from, from experience? Um, well, I, so the, the list that, the, the, the reason is I come from a facility that didn't have GPUs before. Um, now we have a system with NVIDIA GPUs and uh, you know, uh, Zinmin mentioned about Aurora and the Intel GPUs. So when we gave the list to, to Zinmin, it was be totally based on somebody who doesn't have uh, a facility that doesn't have a lot of experience on the, or no experience to, so to speak, um, on the GPU. So, but, but I want to understand now that we have two systems with two flavors of GPUs, um, what, uh, problems we are going to, uh, you know, face when, when we kind of uh, provide guidance to our users as to what directives are important and what are supported and how they should port the application. Well, you know, I don't know what is the status now. I, you know, I, I was a developer in the, um, in the Summit and Sierra compilers back then okay. uh, for Clang, for Clang Your Town specifically. So I know about, you know, up to a, 40, a few years ago, there is no substantial difference as to optimization strategies in the way in which you write your programs. Uh, as much as you can, back then you had to use uh, the combined constructs. Now with the new generic SPND modes in trunk coming also in rock and uh, you can, you know, you have more flexibility on how to write your programs, but there is no way, you know, I, I don't think we can, we can uh, pinpoint anything specific that you ought to be doing on AMD GPUs or NVIDIA GPUs. Now, one thing is uh, the one I pointed at during my slides is unified shared memory. Uh, again, if you are on AMD GPUs, I'm suggesting that you map your memory uh, when you want to use it on an MI200 based system. But you know that's as far as I can go at this point in time. Okay. I, I will also make a comment to note that during the summit procurement, uh, there is basically only minimal OpenMP target offload implementation. In fact, that was one of the thing we had with IBM is to implement that. And OpenMP 4.5 was just released at that time. So most of the support for OpenMP on summit, at least in the early year on summit was from uh, IBM XL compiler only. NVIDIA support for OpenMP is still fairly recent. So there's a there's a difference there. And then uh, our application evolved as Summit uh, being in production more and more when and people started using more OpenMP with the uh, XR compiler. That's a good Just, point, yeah. And again, I'm not, I was not working on the XI compiler, so I cannot possibly comment on that. I was working on the uh, derivation of Clang in, you know, in, in the repository called Clang Your Town, and then that was upstreamed into Trunk uh, by the team. So I, you know, I don't know what Excel does. 
Okay, um, one, one follow-up question to this that I see in the list is, are there any specific features that uh, you want to highlight that will work, um, that work well or any significant features that don't work well at the moment uh, in your compiler? So it's basically washing your dirty linen in public. Um, I need to think about this one, honestly. I, okay. uh, you know, the standard things that don't work well on any compiler, on any GPU, is critical sections like Jeff was talking about. Uh, there are things that are not possible to be, that cannot be potent, possibly implemented correctly on the GPU, like unstructured critical sections. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I need to think about this. I, 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 I'm not prepared to answer these. Um, okay. In a, in a, in Anybody a else? Well, um, yeah, go ahead. I'll just say for our compiler, we've just made the choice that if we don't think it's going to work well, we don't support it at all because then people don't use it and end up sad. So, you know, that's, I'm sure that there are reasons. There's a couple of features I think we could, we could support well that we don't. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, you know, other than some code gen bugs, some 10, 10, 15% performance here and there based upon not having all the right configs tuned up. Um, you know, I, I think the things that we have so far have worked quite well for me. Doesn't work well in your, uh, could you elaborate Jeff? Is it doesn't map well to your- No, no, I just, I literally just compiler imperfections. For example, okay. I have, if you watch the talk that I linked earlier, there's there's a couple of cases where you can lose 5% of the performance and, and there's no good excuse for it. It's just the compiler goes through a different path and that's just how life goes. Um, and I consider you know a 5% performance impact to be the type of thing that an HPC person would care about. Um, although, you know, in the grand scheme of an application, you know, 5% in one kernel may not be visible, but um, that's, that's the only place I can say that I, I have complaints, um, about things that are implemented is when they don't do exactly what I expect them to do performance wise. Okay. And Zinman, you wanted to say something too. Yeah. Besides uh, the vendor specific issues we do find in, in the current, uh, for example, OpenP offloading library implementation, for example, the declared target. So the, for example, for the point lookup taking the long, uh, you know, uh, has huge overhead based on the funding from the, I think Patrick is on the, on the call as well. So basically those are general issues we need to address in the open P offloading library and Johannes and Ravi, all those people has been working on those since. Once those improved, it's going to help all the vendors to improve the open P offloading performance. So, okay. so we do two sets of the issue. One is the one the specific one and also common issues. So the common issue, I definitely get the priority to make sure everyone gets that fixed. Everyone get a benefit from that, yeah. Okay, um, so this was a, a question that might have been asked differently previously, but uh, how do you rate your success of your OpenMP compiler? Um, do you do you if you don't measure it with your native programming model performance? Um, how do you know uh, that you're doing good or bad? Uh, okay, let me start this. For CPU side, I, we truly believe we are pretty successful because, as I mentioned before, we are adding uh, around like some seventy five percent of the peak we can get. CPU side is pretty good. OpenP offloading we just started a couple of years ago. There's still a long way to go, but we are on the track to make sure we deliver good performance, especially for the Aurora project. Yeah. Jeff. Um. Well, I think so. It depends. Um, I've I've written some stuff with NWChem where the performance of OpenMP and OpenACC is the same uh, modulo noise, and to me, that's that's the win, right? That's that's what you'd hope our compiler would do, and 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 we do it. Um, there's like I said, there's a couple other cases where the code gen isn't perfect, um, and but yeah, I would I would say. Um, you know, you'd have to ask NERSC for the final verdict. Obviously, they were they were the priority customer for OpenMP support. But you know, I think for for what what we've been able to do, um, I, I think we've been quite successful. And and certainly, 
um, you know, our platform provides a, a reasonable place to to map that stuff onto. Um, you know, Volta and Ampere do a good job with things, regardless of how you get there. So that that's certainly part of it. Okay. Um, anybody else wants to chime in? We I think we are almost running out of time too. So um, one of the questions that I was asked to ask is about interoperability with math libraries and your native programming model. How does OpenMP works with your uh, vendor specific uh, math library or with uh, your native programming model? Maybe it's more a yay or nay question. Let me, let, me, let me start because this might actually like trickle or will probably trickle back to AMD, HPE and some other studies. Uh, we just finished our LibM, so a math library for GPUs, which at the end of the day is just a static math library that, that is compiled for all the GPU architectures. So you get actual math optimizations for that the compiler knows. So the compiler knows sign zero is zero, but you also get the, the proper vendor specific implementations of all of those and proper optimizations after the fact. So all of that is going to land into LLVM Clang soon and it will even be enabled for things like CUDA and, and HIP and so on and so forth. So this is this is the roadmap. And I would assume that the Clang compiler people will, will like go on the same track afterwards. Okay. Anything so let me add to that, uh, uh, you know, for, for users, right? Uh, uh, what works today uh, is, um, you know, locating memory from HIP and then using it in OpenMP. Uh, this is with Rockham, of course. And then um, uh, we do have a bug when you use specifically OMP target unlock, and then you try to use that pointer, the pointer returned by OMP target unlock in a, let's say, HIP plus routine. Uh, we are fixing that. There's a bug, and we are fixing that. We are working actively to fix that. Uh, so, you know, in the coming version of Rockham, you're going gonna to see uh, that problem go away. Yeah, for Intel, we have been put uh, effort on to support OpenP, for example, dispatch constructor. That's a construct in the OpenP 5.2 allows us to, uh, you know, interact uh, interact with, uh, for example, MKL library, which is uh, supported uh, implemented in the different language. That's part of the interoperability and the composability support. We are putting effort on that. And also other composability support as I uh, showed in the presentation, yeah. We do. Okay, so Jeff brought up uh, MPI too, so maybe people can comment on that too. Um, it's one of the things that I didn't bring up, uh, we, but we are almost out of time. Anyone I can, that wants to comment about Yeah, uh, I, I can say something about that. So with, with Cray MPI, we do support being able to do um, MPI um, communication operations directly on device memory, like all to all, for example, and this, that can turn, be turned on with an environment variable. And so what you can do, for instance, what we have, seen people do in, in, in codes is uh, use OpenMP to obtain device pointers, like with the use device pointer um, clause, for example, and then and then pass that into our, the MPI calls directly, and then being able to uh, leverage that rather than having to do data transfers between device memory and host memory first to do the MPI. And so that that's something that's available, um, and uh, we can see significant speedups using that feature. Okay. Anybody else? We have, oh, we're almost out of time. So, Chayuk, uh, do we have a hard stop or? I think we can have only a couple more minutes, I guess. Okay. Uh, yeah. Anybody wants to add to it or any, 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 any of the attendees have any questions that, um, um, yeah, I not that, uh, uh, Intel YPI took it has uh, OpenP, oh, sorry, has an MPI and the one CCL support for cross node communication to direct the device to device data transfer and all those features. Yeah. Okay. If nobody else has anything, thank you. Thank you all for taking time to doing this. Um, I'm sure it's very useful. Um, we have to find a way to do it more often rather than uh, wait for the ECP annual meetings to, to do that. So thank you. Thank you very much. So, Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.